What is the shortest command found in all of the Bible? You see, today is question and answers Sunday, so I thought that I'd start by asking you a question. The answer to that is really twofold. Number one, go. And the other one, do. As I was thinking about those two answers, I got to thinking about this. Don't you wish my answers could be that short? We'd get out of here pretty quick, wouldn't we? See, I just can't get one-word answers for some reason, especially two-letter one-word answers. That's almost an impossibility for this preacher. But this morning, we're going to be doing three things as far as these questions are concerned. First, we're going to revisit a previous question. Secondly, we're going to look at a brand new question. And then thirdly, we're going to be talking about our mission work and a question about it relative to the month of May. So those are the three things that we're going to be looking at. Let's go back and let's look at a question that we looked at last time. And there's a reason as to why we're revisiting this particular question. You'll remember it probably. If the earth is only... 6,000 years old, how do you account for the Sumerians who lived over 7,000 years ago? In a previous answer, we noted that a man by the name of Sam Harris brought up this particular objection in his book entitled, Letter to a Christian Nation. Here's what he wrote. The same Gallup poll revealed that 53% of Americans are actually creationists. This means that despite a full century of scientific insights attesting to the antiquity of life and the greater antiquity of the earth, more than half of our neighbors believe that the entire cosmos was created 6,000 years ago. This is incidentally now listen to him, about a thousand years after the Sumerians invented glue. When I asked this question last time, my mind was centered upon the birth of Christ and back. So I was going back 6,000 years from the birth of Christ. Folks, we need to go back 6,000 years from today, don't we? If we go back 6,000 years, then the earth dates back to 4,000 B.C. Mr. Harris brings up the Sumerians, who are said to have lived a thousand years before what we believe the beginning of the earth to be. So in other words, the Samaritans were living, and we say the earth was created a thousand years after the Sumerians were already living. He says, how can that be? Well, we need to answer that objection, don't we? And there's two answers that we can give to that particular question. And they're relatively simple answers and they um, reflect on both sides. Okay, here's the first one. Folks, creationists are not hard and fast when it comes to 6,000 years. Years. It's not like we have a calendar that we can just go back and we can date every little thing all the way back and say, yep, it's exactly 6,000 years. Most individuals are willing to concede that there may be a few more hundred, maybe a few thousand years somewhere in the days of patriarchy where we were not keeping records as accurately as we were during the days of Moses and beyond. Folks, the earth could be somewhere between six and 10,000 years old. But folks, if that be the case, the earth is still a very young earth, isn't it? 6,000, 8,000, 10,000. Folks, 
There's a big difference between the earth being 10,000 years old even and 8 billion years old, which is what Sam Harris believes the earth to be. So there's a huge difference between the two. Notice secondly, when it comes to the dates on the Sumerians and when they originated and when they began to develop as a culture, that is not a hard and fast date either. When you go back and you study the historians, most of the historians will date the Sumerians between 35 B.C. and 4000 B.C. Folks, that is in perfect harmony with the pages of God's holy and divine will. In our last lesson, we noted that Adam and Eve were created and placed in a garden called Eden. And that garden called Eden was placed among four rivers, two of those being the Tigris and Euphrates. And that is the very cradle of civilization. That is the very place where civilization developed and that is the heart of what is known as the civilization of Sumer. As we continue to read the book of Genesis, chapter 10, chapter 11, we read about a man by the name of Nimrod. Nimrod was a mighty man, the Bible says. He went out and he built marvelous cities. Cities like Nimrod, Erech, Rehoboth, Kala and reason. And folks, those became the civilization of the Sumerian Empire about which Mr. Harris has spoken. In other words, what we're saying is this. Neither he nor we know the exact date of when man was created nor when the Sumerians became a world empire. But the Bible harmonizes with that early date, does it not? 3,500, 4,000, 5,000 B.C. Folks, here's what we need to realize. Mr. Harris would argue with us about the age of the earth, even if we said the age of the earth is 50,000 years old. You see, to him, that is still an early earth. If I were to say the earth is a hundred thousand years old, he would still argue with me about the age of the earth. If I were to argue with him that the earth is five hundred thousand years old, he would argue with me about the age of the earth. You see, he believes that the cosmos is eight billion plus years old. So what we have to do is we have to argue with theories that confront his old earth ideology. Last time we presented what was referred to as the sun's decreasing size argument. The sun as it burns is slowly decreasing in size, about five feet per day. Now what that means is this, if we take the size of the sun presently and we go back in time, we can see how large the sun was originally when the world was created. Now if we go back 6,000 years, the sun is approximately the same size that it is even today. That's amazing, isn't it? But if we go back eight billion years. Folks, the earth is in the very center of the sun at that particular time and evolution has to occur in the heart of the sun. That's the most ridiculous thing that you could possibly imagine. Let me give you another argument. It's called the population estimates relative to the earth. Evolutionists believe that man has been on this planet Two to three million years. Now keep that in mind. Two to three million years. Let's assume for a moment that humanity began with two humans. Didn't it have to happen that way? I realize they think at some point two apes became two humans and started having babies. But anyway, humanity had to begin with 
Two human beings. One of them had to be a man, and one of them had to be a woman, contrary to the gender people today. You know that? I saw a video just yesterday, and a lady said, all women have wombs. There's this young lady out in the crowd. She hollers out. She says, I have a womb and I'm not a lady. I about fell on the floor. <laughs> you wonder, what is she? But anyway, that's beside the point. If every human had two children, okay? Now think about that. So that means if a couple were together and they each had two children, that's four, right? So two parents have four children. Four people have children. That's eight. Those eight double in number to 16. Then 32, 64, 128, 256. And on we go, folks. By the end of 17 generations, we have finally crossed over the 100,000 mark in population. 131,100. 36 individuals. Now, that involves some deaths of individuals, and it also involves some individuals who continue to live. We're probably at a population at that point of around 200,000 individuals. Now, here's the problem. If man were on the earth just for a million years, not two million, not three million, if man were here just for one million years, that is 26,000 generations. A while ago, we just went through 17 generations to get to 100,000, didn't we? Now, what if we continue that population growth for 26,000 generations? Folks, notice how many people would be on the earth. 10 to the 2,000th power. Now, you go home today and you write this number on a sheet of paper. That is a 10 with 2,000 zeros attached to it. I don't even know if there is a word that describes that big of a number. Now let's assume for a moment that we made all humanity three feet tall. Boy, I'd be a tall person, wouldn't I? But all humanity is three feet tall and all humanity is five inches round. That's some skinny little fellas, isn't it? Guess how many you could put on the earth? 10 to the 82nd power. That is 10 with 82 zeros on it, folks. That's packing the earth just as full as you could possibly pack it. Don't we still have some problems? Folks, we've still got 1,918 zeros to take care of, don't we? Most what we mean by that is this. In order to accommodate that kind of a population, we would need hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of earths. Let's take for a moment our view. We believe that the earth is about 6,000 years old. Folks, that means that there have been 113 generations that have transpired. If that be the case, the population should be 6.7 times 10 to the ninth power. That's 10 with nine zeros. You want to know what the Census Bureau tells us the population is today? 6.9 times 10 to the ninth power. Folks, we are right in harmony as creationists with exactly where the population of the world ought to be. So we're not the crazy ones in this matter. They're the ones who need to deal with population. They're the ones that need to deal with the size of the sun, don't they? You see, when you look at all the evidence, we live on an early, young earth not an old earth, as the evolutionists would have us to believe. Question number two. This is a new question. In Philippians 2 verse 12, the Apostle Paul told the Philippians, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 
The questioner asks, what in the world does that mean? Let's look at Philippians 2.12 for just a minute and notice what Paul says. Wherefore, my brethren, listen to him, as ye have always obeyed, not in my present only, but what? But now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You know, if you were just to hand out a sheet of paper and let individuals write down the meaning of that verse, it would be unbelievable what you would hear people say about this verse. And there is a perverted view for certain. Notice what Paul said, work out your own salvation. Isn't that what he said? Here's what some people believe that verse means. Make your own terms, make your own conditions, make your own principles, make your own rules, make your own commandments relative to salvation. Work out your own salvation. Your salvation is what you desire to do. Notice the second one. I'll save myself the way I think I should save myself. If this is what I think I need to do, then I'll do that. If another person thinks they need to do this over here, that's totally contrary to this view, that's okay because each person is just working out their own salvation. There's some individuals who believe there's no real need to consult the Bible as far as working out my own salvation. I'll do it myself. Whatever I feel is right, I'll do. Now there's others who will say, well, you know, yes, we might need to consult the Bible, but only where it pleases me. I'll take the passages that I like, I'll reject the rest, and I'll just work out my own salvation. There's individuals who believe there's no need to give any heed whatsoever to any spiritual counselors or teachers of God's Word. Folks, this perverted view is what I refer to as the Frank Sinatra approach to salvation. Frank Sinatra had a wonderful song, did he not? I did it my way. And that's the way a lot of people in religion think that they ought to handle their salvation. I'll just do it any way I desire, any way I want to, and God will be pleased with me. Wow. So let's talk about the correct view of Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. There's three things that we need to consider. Notice first, Paul commends the obedience of the Philippians, doesn't he? Notice what he says in verse 12. As ye have always, what? Obeyed. My question is this, what had they obeyed? What had they always obeyed? Folks, they obeyed the apostolic teaching. They obeyed the instructions given by the Apostle Paul who received those from the Holy Spirit of the Almighty God. Ye have always obeyed, he says. If you keep the passage in the context, it goes all the way back to verse 5. And in that verse, Paul says this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, he's telling these individuals, I want you to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. I want you to think like He thinks, and I want you to do like He does. Guess what one thing Jesus did? He obeyed, didn't He? And the Bible even tells us that. He was obedient unto death, even the death of of the cross. Philippians 2 verse 8. Folks, this idea of working out my own salvation and doing it any way I want to and rejecting the commands of God, that is not Bible teaching. In the very context, Paul is commending these individuals for their obedience. And he's telling them, I want you to be like Jesus who was also obedient to His heavenly Father. Working out our salvation definitely involves our obedience to the Almighty God. But point number two, what does it mean to work out 
our own salvation. You see, this is where we need to go into the biblical text and we need to learn how to define words and terms. What does it mean to work out your own salvation? Strong says it means this, to work fully, to accomplish, to finish. Thayer says the definition is to perform, to accomplish, to achieve. Fine says the word means to work out, to affect by toil, to achieve. Folks, you and I have to work out our own salvation. We have to accomplish our salvation. We have to work it out to the very end. We have to labor and toil until it's accomplished, until it's fulfilled, until it's totally finished. You do not start today, stop tomorrow, and hope to be saved. It's not going to happen that way. Folks, when you and I start working on our salvation, guess what? We've got to do it until the very moment that it is a realized blessing in our lives. Barnes makes an interesting statement. He says this, We are to make an honest effort to be saved in the way in which God has appointed. Work out your salvation. Do exactly what God wants you to do all the way to the very end. But notice the third point. You need to do that with fear and trembling. Those two words are different words in the Greek language. And yet, both of them involve the idea of being fearful, of being affrighted, of being scared. These are not words that involve awe and reverence. You work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We could say this, with a fear that involves us in trembling. One might ask, why would we need to tremble in fear as we work out our salvation. I'll give you at least three reasons. Number one, folks, the weight of the responsibility. We're not talking about picking up trash, are we? We're not talking about whether we should dust a room of the house or not. We're not talking about whether I'm going to go to work today or not today. Folks, we're talking about much weightier matters than that. When you talk about working out your salvation, you're talking about your soul. You're talking about something that is deep within you that will never die. And it is a weighty responsibility to save it. Secondly, You and I need to fear and tremble because this is a serious matter at hand. When God thinks of the salvation of man's soul, do you think that's important to Him? I bet He does, don't you? See, God's not too concerned about my outer shell. It's temporary, isn't it? One of these days it's going to be dissolved. When I do come forth out of the grave, it's not going to be in this old physical body. I'm going to have a new body. I'm going to have a glorified body. It's going to be totally different than the one that I have right now. And folks, this idea of the salvation of my soul is serious business. Notice there are eternal consequences that are at stake. When I really stop and think about the fact that it is my obligation, not Kathleen's, not the elders, not yours, it is my responsibility to work out my salvation all the way to the end. I better shake and I better tremble as I go through the process 
of striving to be saved in the last day. And yet how often times do we get up and we don't hardly give it much thought, do we? Because we are so busy on this earth, aren't we? Two questions, folks. Number one, are you truly seeking to bring your salvation to a positive conclusion? When you wake up in the morning, is that on your mind? You know, today may be my last day, mightn't it? This afternoon, I may pass away from this life. And guess what, folks? I had better have been working on my salvation all the way to that end, hadn't I? Secondly, are you really working on your salvation with fear and trembling? A fear that leads to a state of trembling? I want to be saved. It is the most important thing in my life. And when I think about the weight and the responsibility, I tremble in fear that I need to do it right because I desperately want to be saved in the last day. Folks, that's the message of Philippians 2 verse 12. Third question, Ukraine is our mission work for the month of May. Notice the question, where will the money that we collect go and what will it be used for? That's a good question, isn't it? Let's start off by looking at Ukraine for just a minute. You can see it right almost in the dead center of that map, can't you? To the north, east is Russia. And that's where they are invading Ukraine. To the left is Europe. To the south is Africa and also below it is Turkey. It's not a huge country by any imagination. It is the largest country, however, totally in Europe. It consists of 24 provinces and there are over 44 million people who live in Ukraine. Or at least used to live in Ukraine. The capital is Kiev. Or if you listen to the news lately, it's Kiev. I guess it depends on whether you're country or whether you're not country. Things just change as you go along. But it's a beautiful city, folks. Or at least it used to be. The religion in Ukraine is an interesting situation. There's what is referred to as the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. It is somewhat similar to Catholicism. However, there are four different branches of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. But when you combine all four of those branches, it consists of 32.1% of the population. Now watch this next one. The Protestants. And we would be grouped in that group right there. 0.9%. Isn't that unbelievable? 0.9%. Catholics, 0.6%. Islam is there, and it's 0.2%. Judaism is there, 0.1%. Now there's other individuals in the nation who would say, well, yes, I have a religion, but it's none of those things, and they account for 3.2% of the population. Add those up. Folks, we're not even at 40% of the population. Here's what's interesting. 
62.5% of the population of Ukraine will say we are not religious. We are not affiliated with the church. We are not affiliated with any religious group whatsoever. We are just secularists in our mindset. That's unbelievable, isn't it? That's really a rich field to go into. Because at least I do not have to fight false doctrine, do I? I've just got to fight individuals who may not believe in God or maybe they have some belief in God, but they're not connected to a religion whatsoever. But the church over there is very, very, very small. I've talked about in times past this war in Ukraine, haven't we? It started February the 24th, just a little over two months ago. Folks, the casualties in two months' time just regarding civilians is this. 5,840 are dead. That's just the civilian population. That's not any of their soldiers whatsoever. Of those, 201 have been children. When we say children, we're talking about boys and girls under the age of 18. There's been 3,111 injuries. Of those, 299 have been children. Four million people, citizens, have exited Ukraine as refugees and have gone into the surrounding nations. It is believed that over the course of the next two or three months, up to 8 million of the citizens will go into other countries because they've been displaced. Unbelievable, isn't it? 8 million people, folks. That means their population will be down to 36 million rather than 44 million. I've talked about Lisa and Artem Bondarenko. They are members of the Lord's Church over in Ukraine. They live in Kiev, and this is that couple. On a daily basis, they hear the sirens go off. On a daily basis, they have to get down in bunkers. They're constantly hearing explosions. They're constantly hearing gunfire. They constantly know that the Russians are outside of their city. There's dead bodies laying in the streets and dead bodies lay between them and the border any direction they go just about. She posts a lot of pictures relative to the war and most of us have seen many of them. Folks, these are houses, neighborhoods that individuals live in like us. How would you like that to be your neighborhood now? How would you like to have to try to drive down that street in your city? She put up this picture the other day. This is a little girl. They had their home totally destroyed. And she was elated that she found her cat alive and she's holding it. This little girl visits the grave of her mother on a regular basis. Her mother died of starvation because of the war. Folks, this is stuff you and I don't even have to deal with, do we? We don't even have to think about it. Can you imagine being a little child? You walk out, there is no more home, and you're, you find your kitten, your cat, and you're just elated that I've got my cat. The question that was asked is, how in the world are we going to support Ukraine? I don't think this church has ever supported Ukraine before. And that's the way it's been with a lot of congregations of the Lord's people up until now. But we see the images, don't we? And we know those individuals are hurting. 
Our governments, to some extent, have had their hands tied because of various government deals that have been worked out. And we sit here and say, how in the world can I help? I want to do something for those individuals. There's three possible avenues that I've found that we can help those in Ukraine. One of them is referred to as Operation Ukraine. It is a non-profit organization. That organization was founded by this woman, Kathy Caden. I know absolutely nothing about Kathy Caden. The organization is established in Columbus, Mississippi. They've also done a lot of work in Haiti. So that's one avenue that we need to investigate, that we can look at to see if it is worthy of support. Here's another one, the Del Rada Church of Christ. They're located in Montgomery, Alabama. They have five elders, 24 deacons. They are a large congregation of the Lord's people. That's their church building there. Folks, they have already been doing mission work in Ukraine for years and years and years. They have a congregation there that they support. And once the war broke out, they became a place that was a distribution center for relief in Ukraine, getting things into Poland and then on into the nation of Ukraine. So this congregation is one that is trustworthy, one that you know that once you send your money there, that they're going to make certain it gets to those individuals. There's a third avenue, and it's through a man by the name of Roger Campbell. Roger Campbell is a sound gospel preacher. There's a picture of him and his wife Donna. They're about to go on a mission trip even there. He has been a missionary in Ukraine. I just preached a meeting in Bremen, Georgia, and his daughter is the preacher's wife there at Bremen. Like I said, he's done mission work in Ukraine, and what he's been doing over the last several months is he's been collecting monies. He then gets in contact with those preachers, and when they have a need, he sends those monies directly to those individuals so that they can take care of whatever needs they have in their congregation. Someone might say, what kind of needs do they have? There is one preacher who is located on the border between Ukraine and Poland. Folks, sometimes individuals leave their homes at night, make long trips trying to get to the border, to get out and become refugees in Poland. By the time they get to the border, they're tired, they're hungry, they're weary. He has set up 80 cots in his house and in the church building. And individuals can come, they sleep on those cots, they feed those individuals for a day or two, and then send them on their way to complete their journey. Whether they're going in the country or out of the country. Can you imagine? When that man has need of food, when that man has need of another cot, whatever it might be, Roger's able to make certain that he gets the money to, to make certain those supplies are there. Here's what's interesting. I've asked Lisa and her husband several times, what can we do for the church in Kiev? And she says, we don't need anything right now. We just need you to pray for us. Isn't that amazing? And Roger says the same thing. Roger says that when he calls those individuals, hey, how can I help you? How much money do you need? What can I send you? They'll tell him immediately, we just don't need anything. Folks, they're very independent. They're very proud. And they don't like taking help and assistance, but it's needed desperately. In this lesson, we've done three things. Number one, try to clarify an issue regarding a young earth. Number two, we learn that it is up to us to put forth our best effort in order to finalize our salvation. Folks, one of these days, salvation, as far as our souls are concerned, will come to an end, won't it? What we can do about it. And we better make certain we're working and laboring and toiling as hard as we can to finalize it properly. And then lastly, we've introduced three areas 
three avenues of supporting the Ukrainian people. I bring those three up because hopefully this Tuesday we'll sit down with the elders and we'll talk about all three of those avenues and we'll choose one of those and we'll be able to tell you more about how we're going to support those Ukrainians. But here's something we need to remember. This church has already contributed $1,000 in assistance to the Ukraine. We had a call where some individuals were in need of body armor who were the soldiers in the army over there. They went and bought four pairs of body armor, a thousand each, and we contributed $1,000 for one set of body armor for one of those soldiers. So we've already been involved in the work. Here's a question. Do you need to start the process today of working out your salvation with fear and trembling? Now that can be for an alien sinner, can it? I need to obey the gospel right now. I need to start right now to do what needs to be done. I need to confess the name of Jesus having repented of my sins. And I need to put Christ on in the waters of baptism and be forgiven of all my transgressions. I need to do that right now. Maybe we're an erring child of God. And we've quit working and we've quit laboring and we've quit toiling. And we need to repent of that. We need to start again today to finalize our salvation. Do you need to respond to this invitation? Won't you come as together we stand and sing? <clears throat>